The title of this program sounds pretty gross. It contains three words that are disgusting to me. Rat, lungworm, disease. And as I started looking into it, I found that it's even worse than it sounds. Essentially, it's parasitic worms that you get from ingesting a raw or undercooked snail or slug. The worms then make their way from your digestive system up into your brain where they wreak all kinds of havoc before they eventually die. But your body's natural defense mechanisms that deal with dead or live worms in your brain contribute to the discomfort that you feel. In severe cases, you can go into a coma and even die. In milder cases, you'll get better on your own, but you'll probably have a sore stomach and a heavy-duty headache. Early onset symptoms are flu-like. Um, I've talked to people who knew they ate a slug and they can tell me the timeline of it. So the first thing that they noticed was that um, they had stomach problems. Um, it can include diarrhea, it can include vomiting, or it can just include stomach aches. Uh, then from there it went to muscle and joint pains, um, exhaustion, feeling very, very tired. Sometimes a feeling of something crawling under the skin or pins and needles types feelings and then oftentimes insomnia where you just couldn't sleep. And then it would from there morph into headaches, um, a very very bad headache. That's a sign then that you probably have the parasite in the brain. Um, stiff neck, so meningitis type symptoms and then it will progress from there to paralysis. You may have facial paralysis. It could be paralysis of the limbs. Um, from that, it can move into uh, extreme skin sensitivity, uh, what they call paresthesia, where the slightest movement of air even is very, very, very painful. People often describe the pains as uh, being stabbed with a hot knife. Uh, and then as the case progresses, as in my son's case, um, a loss of uh, ability to speak, um, ability to remember words, it can cause hallucinations, and then it can cause coma, which in my son's case he went into a coma. So those are the symptoms. And again, at the start it is flu-like. It could, it could uh, look similar to leptospirosis symptoms. And um, this is why we're working on a diagnostic to try to help to better get a handle on infection rates. So part of the problem is that the early symptoms are things that most people won't go to the doctor for anyway. And even if you go to the doctor, it isn't easily diagnosed. So by the time you find out you have rat lungworm disease, you're probably really sick. So researchers are looking for a more efficient way to diagnose the disease earlier. Unfortunately, right now the most definitive way is an invasive spinal tap. On the bright side, at least more doctors and healthcare professionals are aware of the disease, which wasn't the case 10 years ago. You're probably wondering why it's called rat lungworm disease when you get it from ingesting a snail or slug. Well, it's complicated. Here's a simplified version that's still pretty complex. The adult worms live and lay eggs inside of the rat. When the eggs hatch, the rat basically poops out the baby worms in its feces. These phase one larvae enter the snail and slug when they eat the rat feces and then mature into stage 2 and most notably stage 3 larvae inside the snails and slugs. Then the rat eats the snails and slugs and the larvae mature into adult worms. The cycle begins all over again. It's pretty complex but the main thing to remember is that the stage 3 larvae are the only ones that are infective to humans and stage 3 larvae are predominantly found in snails and slugs. So the only stage that's infective to the rat and to any accidental host is in the slug or snail. There's no stage that we know of in the rat that can be infective to humans or to other animals. So that's why we really have to, yes, control the rat, but we really need to make sure that we're controlling slugs and snails as well. That's where we get infected. Right about now, I should mention that stage three worms are sometimes found in parenthetic, secondary or accidental hosts, 
such as freshwater prawns and shrimp because I remember people used to eat raw prawns and raw river opai. Not a good idea nowadays. Thorough cooking and freezing will kill the parasites and they aren't found in saltwater shellfish. And I'm told that even though chickens love to eat slugs, you can't get it from eating raw chicken eggs. We know that there is an increasing trend. That we can clearly see from both Department of Health records and then also some, from some independent health uh, nonprofit organizations that are basically looking at the code for rat lungworm disease and looking at how many hospital discharges there were. So there's a discrepancy between DOH numbers and um, this nonprofit health organization. One thing is clear is that the trend line is increasing, it is not decreasing, it is steadily going up. Okay, now that you know the basics of rat lungworm disease, you might be saying to yourself, I'm not at risk, I don't eat slugs or snails. The reason this was a rare disease up until now is probably because it wasn't very often that someone would ingest an infected slug or snail. That all began to change with the introduction of an invasive species, a major facilitator in the process, the Asian semi-slug. It was first discovered on Oahu in 1996 and made its way to the Big Island in 2004. The trend of the increase in cases coincides with the arrival of um, a very effective carrier, the semi-slug Parmarian martensi. Another thing that I noticed too is recently we started to see more cases out of Maui and so I decided I thought I wonder if the semi-slug has arrived there. It used to only be known to be on Hawaii Island and Oahu. So I posted a picture on Facebook and I said Maui folks has anyone seen this slug? And a couple days later a woman came back and said yes. I described it a little more, asked her to take a picture and there it was. So there seems to be some correlation between this slug's presence and an increase in case numbers. Robert Hollinsworth did a study on the semi-slug back when cluster cases started to occur 2005 and 6. Um, they started to look at the semi-slug as a carrier and doing the same type of DNA analysis. We're able to identify that these were very effective hosts. They were running at about higher than 75% infection. So out of every four slugs you saw, three of them would be infected. In my studies, there's many times I'll go out and collect and get 100% infection. And not only that, they carry large burdens of parasites. We've tested one slug and estimated 7,000 parasites in it. So basically, studies have shown that a lot more of the semi-slugs have rat lungworm compared to the Cuban slugs. And also that the small young semi-slugs can have the parasites as well. This is cause for concern because the small young semi-slugs are tiny and translucent and are easily overlooked if they get into your food. Another cause for concern, and this sounds like an oxymoron, but the semi-slug is an athletic slug. It can get into your containers of produce, your food preparation areas, and your water catchment systems. I did quite a bit of uh, graduate work studies also looking at this slug and what happens if it climbs in water, especially like a catchment tank, and drowns. And it's very effective at shedding parasites. It does not have to be damaged. Many of the other species have to be damaged to shed parasites, but this one does not. It will drop large numbers of parasites after it drowns and they can live, I've had them alive for up to three weeks um, in water so they can survive for some time. If I were to be using catchment water I would be recommending to make sure that you had uh, filters. We recommend a 20 plus a 5 at least although we are still looking at filters and whole house UV. Um, we should remember that at every tap you should have potable water. That includes your showers, your bathroom sinks. So controlling for slugs and snails around your catchment tank, keeping your catchment system clean, your roof clean, your gutters clean, keeping rats away, those are really important things for people on rainwater catchment systems. For those of you unfamiliar with the semi-slug, I thought it might be helpful if I share my personal experience. 
The first time I saw a semi-slug on my property was in 2013 and it looked so unusual with a hump on its back that I thought it might be an adolescent stage of some other more normal looking slug. About a year later I started noticing slime trails on my windows and screens up high where I never saw slugs before. By three years later the semi-slugs had become quite common. I go out at night and I see them up high on railings and on my porch at least six feet above the ground. I see them about eight to ten feet up on walls and gutters and for a while they were getting into my dog's food dish so often that I began using paper plates so if I saw a slug on the dish I just throw the paper plate away. Once I put the paper plate up high on a table to keep it away from the slugs I went back out I saw a semi slug in the plate and I don't think it just stumbled upon the plate I think it was actively seeking it out. Once I picked luau leaves and I didn't want to deal with them that night so I rinsed them off there were no slugs I put them in a cooler soaked them in water overnight the next day when I went to clean the luau leaves I dumped the water out and there was a semi slug in the cooler this is the cooler it was closed and the semi slug actually crawled in probably through this space so semi slugs are very active and they climb and they can get into your food preparation area they can get into your food containers your produce containers and they can get into your water catchment systems um, if people are not informed as to how careful you have to be in washing your produce and this means any headed vegetable whether it's lettuce celery bok choy you have to take it all the way apart and wash it leaf by leaf checking carefully looking and then under running potable water washing carefully put it in a spinner dry it these parasites do not handle dry conditions well but they can live for a long time in wet conditions so again careful preparation knowing that the person who made that salad you want to eat is informed about this disease and knows how to wash it properly so cooking and cleaning will kill the parasites Oops, my bad. I just said cooking and cleaning will kill the parasites. That's not true. What I really meant to say was cooking and freezing will kill the parasites. Carry on. Raw produce should be washed thoroughly. And it would be a good idea to seal your catchment system and use the proper water filters. Now these are all reactive methods. There's a problem out there and we're reacting to it as well we should. But let's not forget about a proactive method which is to get rid of the problem at its source. At the beginning of the program we talked about the complex life cycle of these worms. So remember, if a rat doesn't eat an infected snail or slug, the worms don't mature into adults. And if snails and slugs don't eat infected rat feces, the stage 1 larvae won't mature into the stage 3 larvae that's infective to humans. I'll be the first to admit we can never get rid of rats and slugs but we can and should try to at least contain and control them around our gardens and homes. When I talked to the people at the College of Pharmacy about the semi-slug, they actually asked me, how do I kill the slug? Well, I got a lot of sadistic ways that usually involve maiming and body parts, but I told them I just smash them with a rock. And they told me by smashing the slug, you're releasing the parasites that can be eaten by other worms and slugs. Now remember, not all slugs are infected. And they also said by handling and smashing the slugs, parasites might find their way onto my vegetables or at worst case, into my mouth. So apparently there's a correct way to kill a slug and kill the parasites as well. At this point, I will say slug bait works really good, but some brands are toxic to pets. It can be expensive and I generally don't like any kind of chemicals around my food crops. So let's take a look at a simple and affordable way to dispose of slugs. Today we're going to learn how to make a slug jug. This is part of doing slug and snail control to control rat lungworm disease around your house, 
your rainwater catchment tank, your garden, your farm, or your school garden. Uh, so the slug jug is a nice, uh, pretty pesticide-free way to make uh, a, some way to dispose of slugs and snails. We use it as part of our integrated pest management strategy for school garden projects. Um, and basically it's a very high uh, concentration of salt water. So we recommend using a wide mouth jug because some of our animals like the African snail are quite large so you want something with a large mouth. This is a one gallon jar that I got from Blaine's drive-in, paid a quarter for it. And so the recipe is real simple, basically seven cups of water to one cup of salt. It makes a 15% salt water solution and we've looked in the lab and know that that will kill the slugs and snails. It will also kill um, the rat lungworm parasites. We also will put flatworm species in the jug as well when we're collecting because flatworms can also be carriers of the rat lungworm parasite. So it's best to label your jug. Um, we always put the recipe on it so that the kids at school can learn how to make them for home. And then we label the back so that nobody uses this jug to say drink from or mistake it somehow. So you want to put some kind of a warning label on the back so that people know what it is. So pretty simple. If you can get your jug open. So I've measured out seven cups of water here and I'll just add it to my jug. And then you can use any type of table salt you want. I usually go for whatever is cheap. So this was a little under two dollars and I've measured out one cup of salt. Well, this becomes a super saturated salt water solution and it's actually a little hard to get all the salt to dissolve in here but it's still plenty salty that it's going to kill a slug or snail. But you want to shake it up a little bit. Try to get as much as you can to dissolve, and it will dissolve over time. When you put your slugs and snails in here, you're going to leave them in here for a while. I never put them in and dump the jug out right away. The la after the last slug or snail or flatworm is added, I let it sit for a week. And then that, I make sure that any parasite that might be released by the dead animal is dead. If you have a big population at your house, you might want to make a couple of these. And then when one gets full, if you need to, to let it sit for a week before you dump it out, you have another one to be using. So that's the simple part of making your slug jug. Now, when you go out and collect your slugs or snails, you always want to wear gloves. You can either buy uh, the latex gloves at Long's Drugs or uh, Target or any of the stores, or you can wear garden gloves. But you always should be wearing gloves whenever you go out and do your collection. And also, you don't want to touch them, not even if you have gloves on. There is a potential for entry through skin, especially broken skin. So I like to use the tongs or I use disposable chopsticks. Now after you've added slugs or snails, it could get stinky. I'm not going to lie, this gets a little smelly. What we do at home when it gets smelly like that is I'll take a little bit of bleach, maybe about an eighth of a cup. I just give a little dash into the jug and it really cuts the smell and then I can continue using it. When it just simply is too disgusting and you really want to get rid of it, we take it to a gravel area, a driveway, or a rocky area, or somewhere where we don't want weeds or plants to grow. Because this heavy salt water concentration will kill plants. So you can use it like Roundup if you want to. It's kind of a, a, a biologically safe Roundup. Um, just dump your slugs and snails, dump the water out on the ground in a gravel area or a rocky area. You can give it a little bit of a rinse with bleach to clean it out again and then go ahead and make another batch up and you're ready to go again. Now at the schools we cannot use bleach at the school garden projects so we are looking for another disinfectant that might cut the smell. So the smell is something we put up with in order to not be using pesticides and you know slug baits and that type of thing. So this is a integrated pest management way of dealing with those little garden pests that you want to keep under control. Alright, so now we're going to go slug hunting. One of 
my favorite types of traps. It's just a plastic bag that's cut open. The plastic, the animals really like the moisture. So you can see here's a Cuban slug. And they're kind of oval shaped. They look a lot like a leaf. Any slug or snail can carry the rat lungworm parasite. We also want to make sure we don't look into the jug when we put it in. We don't want to have splash back in our eyes. So when you're slug hunting, you want to look under things. Um, that's where slugs and snails are going to hide. So for instance, under this pot. Right there, two Cuban slugs. So we'll put them in the jug. So check the bottom. I can see there's another one and also a small semi slug. And you can really cut populations down by going around and just hunting. If you hunt at night, you're going to have more activity. They'll be out crawling during the daytime. You need to look under things, look around things. They'll often go very deep under rocks and then it's pretty hard to find them. You've got to wait for them to come out at night. So these, here are a couple of semi-slugs. Uh, the large ones, when stretched out, can be two to three inches long. You see this little hump on the back here. Uh, there's a couple of very distinguishing features of the semi-slug. This is Parmerian martensi. It has this little hump on the back and a little slit in the middle of this, uh, this part of its back that it can sometimes open up and you'll see a little shell that's about the size of your fingernail. So this guy is actually evolving uh, away from being a snail more to being a slug, but it still has the residual tail. Another very distinguishing feature is what's called a keeled tail. So unlike the Cuban slug, which is rounded, more like a leaf, this has a ridged tail, which they call keeled. Something else that's a little bit harder to see is the tail has a fork in it. Um, from the, if you're looking from the side, you'll see a V-shaped cut. And that's a very distinguishing uh, feature of it. But here you can see it's starting to expose its shell a little bit. These slugs are fast. They're very good climbers. Um, they like to be around human habitation. They like to try to get into your house. They really like cat and dog food. We've had a number of dogs, puppies in particular, that have um, gotten rat lungworm disease. My friend's puppy, they had to put it down. Um, so it's really important to bring pet food in at night. But you can see they're a pretty, pretty quick climber. They uh, can cover quite a bit of territory in a short period of time unlike the Cuban slug. I've been going out and hunting slugs at night because I want to see what they're eating. And I will say that it's pretty discouraging at first because you go out and you get a bunch and the next night there's still plenty of them around. But over time, you will see less and less, especially the semi-slug. Semi-slugs were getting very established around my house, but after hunting them down, I don't see too many anymore and that's encouraging. This program has been an overview of the situation and I didn't get into details on a lot of the topics. So if you're like me, you probably have a lot more questions and I encourage you to go and seek out the answers. If you do an internet search on the topic, you'll find plenty of informative videos and articles. The UH Hilo has an excellent webpage on rat lungworm disease that includes the answers to frequently asked questions. Go to pharmacy dot uhh dot hawaii dot edu forward slash rlw in closing i would like to emphasize the problem of invasive species in hawaii rat lungworm has been around for decades in the islands but the problem was compounded by the arrival of the semi-slug hopefully this unwanted guest won't get out of control like little fire ants and cokey frogs 
Please help control invasive species and minimize their negative impact on the environment and our lifestyle. Beyond that, I hope you'll make your voice heard and encourage our legislature to increase funding and resources for biosecurity. There's a lot more invasive species out there that would love it in Hawaii, and we have to keep them out. Controlling invasive species isn't easy, and it seems to get harder every day, but I hope you'll give it your best shot. E maala maka'aina. Take care of the land. Aloha. Ahoy, ahoy.